And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today as we're finishing out the week. And as we try to do, you know, just like with workouts, you want to finish your workout strong. Uh, We've had a great week so far. We're going to finish out strong today in uh, Hands-On Apologetics by uh, bringing up a heavy hitter who is William Hemsworth, our good friend William Hemsworth, going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Going to talk about um, eternal security and uh, specifically passages in First Epistle of John. And anybody who has been defending, explaining the faith with Protestants over the years, you know this can sometimes be a little thorny issue. First uh, John is often brought up as... Uh, giving evidence that you can have certainty that you are going to make it to heaven no matter what. And uh, usually it's uh, this is put against Catholics that, you know, you don't have this assurance of salvation that's guaranteed in First John and other places as well. And uh, so therefore you're not part of biblical Christianity. Well, is that true? Well, that's what William Emsworth is going to be coming on. We're going to be talking about eternal security and First John. And uh, First John's a very fascinating uh, writing in the New Testament. Sometimes it's a little difficult to follow. He tends to, his thoughts just whirls around sometimes at breakneck speed. And it's, sometimes it's a little hard to follow what he's saying. And it's very important because if you misunderstand him, it could sound like uh, he's teaching these kind of things about once saved, always saved, can't lose your salvation, can know that you are being saved, and all this other stuff. So that's going to be broken down for you by our good friend William Hemsworth on the other side of the break. On this side of the break, as we always do, we sharpen our critical thinking skills. And since it's Friday, we switch things up. We do some CrossFit training apologetic-wise. And instead of looking at an informal fallacy and our finding the fallacy segment, we are going to look at a propaganda technique. Today's propaganda technique is the demoralization propaganda. And um, actually, I don't think we've touched on that on this program before. So that will be a fascinating look. Also, we're going to meet early church father. Today's early church father, I would guess, would not be... Uh, Father, probably known to many of you, since uh, most of our listeners are in the West, probably most of you are Latin rites, Uh, you might not be familiar with Aphrates, the Persian sage. So we're going to talk about uh, Aphrates, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, and also demoralization technique, and then eternal security, all that coming up on the show today. So got a fantastic show in store for us. So let's begin on the right foot by welcoming everybody to the dojo, beginning with our live stream audience and also our uh, everybody out there listening on radio around the country and also, by the way, via podcast around the world, either through our handy-dandy phone app or through our flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And that is our official dojo mailbox, uh, not no, dojo mailbox, do, uh, dojo, um, uh, I don't know, I guess mansion, because we shared the mansion with many other programs, such as Jesus 911, Terry and Jesse Show, all the other great shows that we produce. Um, so that's the place to go, folks. If you want to, uh, maybe you can't listen to the entire program today, but you want to find out what William says uh, concerning eternal security in First John. You just go to virtualmostpowerfulradio.org. You scroll down until you see hands-on apologetics. Click it, and boom, you have all the programs right there. You can download them. You can share. You can tell friends about them. Do all that stuff, and you can listen to the rest of the program at the comfort and leisure and uh, you know whatever time is convenient for you. Um, so that's one of the cool things about the show is that our outreach is, isn't just a live audience listening on radio, but I know a lot of people uh, listen to this program through podcast. So uh, just really cool stuff. And also I want to thank you for sharing all this stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, before we begin, just want to 
catch up with you, telling you some things that are going on in uh, the world here. Um, the uh, Revolt Against Reality, my latest book, has been out and has been burning up the bookshelves. It's fighting the foes of sanity of truth from the serpent to the state. I've been doing a lot of interviews. Uh, it's starting to taper off now. Uh, the book's been out for a couple of months, but it's received a lot of notoriety. And, um, in fact, uh, I'm doing a weekly segment on uh, Matt Swain's show, Sunrise Morning Show, early in the morning on EWTN Network, plugging the book and telling people about hands-on apologetics. And uh, that's been great. Again, a lot of great feedback. And, um, yeah, if you haven't picked up the book, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's got everything that I'd want in a book because I put it in there. <laughs> and if you're confused about how the world is just spinning out into chaos and nothing is making sense, uh, Revolt Against Reality will give you the historical backdrop because really we are living at the end of a long process of rebellions against the incarnation. And I spell that out for you in the book and make all sorts of very interesting connections, things that you probably never would have put together um, unless you uh, did this kind of survey. So I highly recommend it. It's Revolt Against Reality. It's put out by Catholic Answers Press. Just go to shop.catholic.com if you want to pick up a copy of Revolt Against Reality. And, uh, yeah, I'm still doing interviews, though. That's been a lot of fun. Also, on the Apocrypha Apocalypse, my channel on uh, YouTube with William Albrecht, we, we are moving and shaking the world in terms of the Old Testament canon. I believe this is probably the issue between Catholics and Protestants. It, there's so much writing on whether your Bible contains the correct number of books. Of course, Protestant Bibles are missing seven books that are found in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles. And we've been doing all these in-depth videos and interviews concerning the Deuterocanon. Recently, we've been releasing a... a interview that William and I did with uh, Dr. John Bergsma on Dead Sea Scrolls. And recently, there's been a video conference on Catholicism, an anti-Catholic conference, where they try to debunk, I guess you could say, Catholicism, uh, with uh, uh, Anthony Rogers, Matt Slick, and other guys as well. And uh, man, it, it's really atrocious. So I think sometime within the next couple of weeks, William Albrecht uh, he already asked me to come on and some other well-known uh, apologists, and we're going to go and look at that conference and basically, you know, give you a peek behind the curtain and show exactly what these arguments, how they fail and how they're actually vacuous. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, in fact, I might even be on Sam Shamoon's show uh, next week to talk about that as well. So lots of great stuff. Lots of great stuff. So enough about me. Let's go to the finding the fallacy, which is a propaganda technique called demoralization technique. Demoralization is in the context of warfare, national security, and law enforcement, a process of psychological warfare with the objective to erode morale among enemy combatants and or non-combatants that can encourage them to retreat, surrender, or defect rather than defeating them in combat. Um, I really think that we're getting pounded by this kind of propaganda technique, and uh, sometimes it's not very easy to see. But uh, there, I think there is a concerted effort, by, especially by secularists and secular media, to turn Catholics against each other and um, demoralize us, either by uh, pointing out the faults in leadership or, uh, you know, uh, grievous sins, things like that. And this is nothing new, folks. I mean, this is the standard work of the enemy throughout history. I mean, and the hope is by dropping your morale, your enthusiasm to fight, that either you'll retreat, surrender, or defect. And, uh, yeah, so it's something to keep in mind, too. Um, and for me, I just, what I do to avoid this is I um, just be careful about what kind of things that I watch. You know, does this help me in my spiritual walk? Is the information solid? Is it unbiased? You know, is this information tempting to make me feel good? Is it bias confirming? Or is it just, uh, you know, is it just good old plain news? And I think you have to be careful like that, just like you would be careful about what kind of food you eat to be healthy. 
you got to be careful about what kind of things you see, what kind of things you read, um, because uh, you could be affected by today's propaganda technique, which is the demoralization technique. So keep that in mind. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, okay, so let's move to our early church father for today, who is Ephrates, the Persian sage. Like I said, not exactly a household name, but also he is part of the early church fathers, an important witness to the early faith. Of Ephrates, the oldest of the fathers of the Syrian church, there is virtually a total lack of biographical information, says Jurgen's faith in the early fathers. Nothing new there. Often we don't have a lot of information about him. He was born about the year 280 AD and died about 345 AD. Uh, he is invariably known as the Persian sage. He was an ascetic, and he probably was a bishop, uh, but his see is not known. We have treaties by Ephrates, 23 treaties, uh, which were wrongly called homilies. Their extent in their original Syriac, uh, 10 were written between 336 and 337 AD, and next 12 between 343 and 344 AD. And uh, the last, uh, the 23rd, in uh, was written in 345 AD. Um, let's see, do I have enough time? I probably don't, but I'll try to squeeze it in. Anyway, um, no, I just don't think I could do this in time. And I don't want to slight this early church father because, you know, he is part of those stellar witnesses to the ancient faith. And so, uh, you know, it's better just to give you the info rather than start a sentence and stop right in the middle of it. So that's our early church father for today, Ephrates, the Persian sage. Coming up next, talk about a sage. We're going to have our good friend William Hemsworth on to talk about eternal security. Stay tuned, folks. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. Well, you know, if you've been defending and sharing the faith, you know that uh, there's this idea out there of eternal security, once saved, always saved. Uh, they'll say you can know for certainty that you are going to heaven. And uh, one of their favorite books is the Epistle of John, first Epistle of John, to demonstrate these things. So we have our good friend William Hemsworth with us to look deeper into this issue. William Hemsworth, of course, is a former ordained Baptist and Lutheran who converted to Catholicism while attending seminary. He is a father and husband who is passionate about passing on the faith and assist uh, teaching adults and children at his parish in Tucson, Arizona. Popular author, blogger, podcaster. You can check out his stuff at williamhemsworth.com. Or most definitely check out his YouTube channel, which is called The Bible Catholic. And William, welcome back to Hands-On Apologetics. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me back on. How you been? Been a long time. Yeah, it's it's been good. I mean, I, you know, fighting the snow and the cold and just trying to make it through winter, as I'm sure you are there in Tucson. <laughs> of course. We had our bout of winter a couple of days ago. Actually, it rained yesterday. We were supposed to have a slight chance of snow, but it warmed up to 63, so we kind of dodged that bullet. I don't know what <laughs> happened there, but we'll take it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Carl Keating was on the show the other day. He was He was rubbing it in as well so ah uh, man well it, do, does it ever snow in uh your area of tucson I, I mean obviously like flagstaff gets snow because uh, high flag, elevation flagstaff had record levels of snow a couple days ago and it'll normally snow like once a year we haven't got it yet um okay now a couple weeks ago it did get down the windshield was 15 believe it or not wow but there was no rain around just a lot of wind uh, so num once a year, normally there'll be some uh, dusting at least, but so far we haven't had it. Wow. Well, okay. Well, consider yourself blessed then. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, th yeah, things have been going good. Uh, yeah, we missed you. Uh, I know you've been super busy with all your stuff. And, and by the way, your YouTube channel is fantastic. Just great oh, interviews and, and things like that. And we'll talk about that at the end. But before that, uh, let's talk about eternal security. Now, now you were a former Baptist and yeah. former Lutheran. I know Lutherans don't believe in once saved, always saved. Um, but did you ever hold on to this position? I did, and that's what I was actually taught when I was growing up in the Wesleyan Church as well. 
and with mm-hmm. Western Church, it's kind of hit or miss depending on the congregation. But it's really that idea is like once you trust Jesus as Savior, all sins, past, present, future are forgiven at that point, and you can know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die. And so that's obviously a big sticking point, okay, between Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and and Protestants is that whole idea. And so that whole idea of once saved, always saved is a huge evangelism tool for Protestants, especially for those that hold to it. Not all Protestants hold to it, but a, a, most of your like Baptists will. Um, the people that are really big in evangelization, they will, they will talk about once saved, always saved. And like I said, it's just that idea that once you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you know where you're going when you die. That's that, and that's it. And one of the verses they'd love to use is a First John five thirteen, and it says, "I write this to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life." And so how that would normally work is, you know, you go up to someone and I've done this in parking lots and everything else. Do you believe, and I ask them, are you, are you a Christian? Well, yes, no. Well, where are you, where are you, do you know where you're going to go when you die? No. Well, the Bible says that you can know. And this is one of the prime verses that they're going to point to is first John five thirteen, And on the surface, it looks very convincing. Okay. Oh, I write this. Who, if I believe in the name of, of the Son of God, I know I have eternal life. Sign me up. And so, for those who maybe don't know the background of this book and everything that comes before this passage, and really everything that comes after that passage, um, maybe they can call. They can. They'll they'll fall for it, if you will. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing I want to talk about is everything that comes before. You know, the background, exactly what John is addressing here. And then I, what this verse is, and the verse right after it, that puts in a much better context. So there very it is. Good. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, and, um, you know, First John, uh, it's a beautiful epistle. Very s- it is. simple, and yet, you know, sometimes his thought kind of winds around a bit. You know, <laughs> it, it's not a very systematic writing, and uh, it's it, it, if you're not careful, you got to follow his thought, and sometimes right. it kind of goes around in circles. Yeah, and this is, I think this is probably my favorite book of the New Testament. I've always been drawn to it, even outside of that passage. My favorite passage in this book comes in the first chapter. It's First John one nine, that says. Read it here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's my favorite verse. Mm-hmm. It just lets me know that no matter how bad I mess up, <laughs> I go to confession, I'm forgiven. It's all good. It's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it makes me feel good knowing that God's grace, no matter what I do, it's free. He loves me no matter what. And as long as I repent, I'm, he's going to forgive. And the, th- the cool thing is he's going to forget what that sin was. I may not forget. That's where I mess up, but he is. But yeah, this this book, it's just a beautiful book. We have so much in here. We have, it talks about the incarnation right off the bat, those first four verses there, yeah. who Jesus is, because we got to remember what John is writing to. Um, yes, this is early on in the church's history, of course, but errors started creeping up. You know, depending on what commentary you read, it may be like an early form of Gnosticism, maybe uh, Docetism, or Serinthianism, which was a form of adoptionism. You know, the idea that it wasn't that the spirit of the Son of God went into someone, and the idea was when he, before he got crucified, that spirit left the man. It was just a normal man who died on the cross. Obviously, we don't believe that as Catholics, and Protestants don't believe that either. Um, most scholars say it's it's addressing docetism, the idea that all material is evil, that Jesus was more of a spirit figure. And John is very clear. First, verse one here, that which was from the beginning, from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It kind of goes back to this first verse of this gospel that he also wrote, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So it's a very, he's attesting to Christ, his humanity as well, as well as his divinity. So right off the bat, you see him addressing some of these issues. And I think sometimes we lose, we lose focus on that. 
especially when it comes to that passage later on in 513 with the whole eternal eternal security deal. Well, who is he referring to here? If you believe they're in the wrong Jesus, you have no hope whatsoever. You have to know who Jesus is, and that's what he's addressing right off the bat here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the most striking things of 1 John is uh, 1 John 1, the very end, you know, what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears uh, concerns the word of life. And and, he sa- and yes. then he says that we have fellowship with the Father and the Son, and basically he says, and you can have fellowship with the Father and the Son by having fellowship with us, you know? <laughs> It's in like, the church, yes. Yeah, being part of that community is essential. Right, that word we, it, it, it's essential. He's not just saying I, we, mm-hmm. the apostles, the apostolic teaching that was already present at that time. So remember, the Bible wasn't collated yet. Some of these books were written. I mean, in First John was written, obviously, after, after the gospel, for the most part, what most, most people believe. But it was the apostles going out preaching, teaching who Jesus was, what his message was. And John saying, if you believe what we teach, you have the truth. And what is that truth? And that's what he lays out through it, especially in relation to who Jesus is. You know, he talks about Jesus as advocate. Um, He talks about Jesus as son of God, the incarnation. 21 times he calls Jesus the son and he says it twice in Second John, which, of course, is a very, very tiny letter that we're not going to get into today. But he, he says he's with the Father, and himself is the life of God. Jesus is true God and eternal life in First John 5.20. So he's affirming over and over again the deity of Christ here. And, yeah, maybe not a fully developed thing like we see when we see at Nicaea and for other cancels, but the whole idea of the hypostatic union is here. Fully God fully man. He died for us that we may have life in his name. And what's interesting, Gary, I always find this interesting. And I asked this question to our good friend, Ken Litchfield one time, because I used this whole line. I was, we were talking about objections. I said, well, the Bible says we can know. How about first John five thirteen? And Ken says, yes, absolutely. But how about the 20 things that you have to do before the end of that point, <laughs> which is all laid out in this gospel. And Steve Ray said the same thing one time when I asked them, because I always like to throw that question out because it's a very common one that you're still going to hear all the time. Right. So the son took on himself a complete human nature that we have. So he's real man, but he's sinless. And so that's a, that's a, that's a theme throughout this book. You have to know who Jesus is to know who you're believing in. Because if you believe in someone who was not the Messiah, who's an antichrist, as John calls calls here, you don't, you can't have that hope. You just can't have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. So it isn't just some vague notion. It's very no. concrete. And uh, yeah, obviously, if you deny uh, Jesus is the Son of God, or especially with First John, it would be that he came in the flesh. You know, not right. only are you, that you wouldn't have security, but you'd be the Antichrist. Right. And John uses that term. He says, those who, I mean, those who say that Christ did not come in the flesh, they are Antichrist. Like, that's a very powerful word. I mean, we always think of the Antichrist as like something out of the book of Revelation, you know, come, someone who's going to do all these evil things. Here's John here. You don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. You are an Antichrist. Period. End of story. And so, and that's exactly, there were these people in the church at this time. They started believing this false notion of who Jesus is, that he was not the Christ. He wasn't the Messiah. He didn't come in the flesh. He was more of a a spirit type character. And they were leading people astray. And so the people here that he's writing to, and it could have been in Ephesus, because that tradition says that's where he lived out his last days was in Ephesus. But they were concerned, of course, like, what is truth? They started getting more like, who's the truth? We have, we have these people leaving saying they, they know the truth. But here's John. He's reassuring them. Listen to what we say. Because mm-hmm. we touched him. We knew him. We walked with him. And in the case of John, I was there at the cross with him. I was there when the spear went into his side and water and blood came out. And he mentions this later on in this letter. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to what he says at the end of his gospel. I write, I write these things to you so that you may believe 
in the Son of God and have life in his name. That's what he says at the end of John's gospel, of the gospel that he wrote. And so it goes back to this, too. And there's just so, so much more to look at than just, you, you know you have saved. Here's chapter 5, verse 13, done, end of story. There's so much more before that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're chatting with William Hemsworth, talking about eternal security and First John. So more to come right after the break. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics. We'll be right back. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with William Hemsworth, talking about eternal security in First John. And uh, yeah, you know, boy, there's just I, I love First John. There's so much. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it, in terms of you know Christ coming in the flesh. The Gnostics or the Docetists could look at the Gospels and they could spiritualize the interpretation whenever it refers to Christ's physical body. They could say this this was only an appearance or this was a kind of quasi physical body or something. But you know, First John really nails it down where it's like, hey, we know we know the facts about Christ. Why? Because we saw him, we touched him, you know, we had physical contact with him. <laughs> so anyone who says differently than us. Uh, you know, they're the Antichrist. I just love that. No, it's, 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 it does, it leaves no room for error. You have to believe yeah. that he came in the flesh. If you don't, you're denying the incarnation. I mean, it really is what it boils down to a central doc doctrine of the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a, to me, he's just so blunt with it that I just love it. I love that in your face stuff sometimes. And when I read it, when I read this letter, there's so much of it that I, it just explodes off the page for me. Like, for example, Gary, I mean, we've talked about the Trump verse. You call it a Trump verse in your CD series, The Salvation Guaranteed. Guys, check out that series. Cheap plug, Gary. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. GaryMachuda.com. All right. Yes, <laughs> myself finish it off. <laughs> so we talk about First John 5.13, and then some. we have a tendency sometimes to go, well, what, what, what how about James? You know, <laughs> we, we go to James and talk about, well, James says you're not saved by faith alone, but by works. But go back into into this letter from First John, though. And in chapter 2, verse 3, he writes, And by this we may be sure that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Kind of goes away with faith alone at that point. Really, when you think about it. Because when I was always taught about faith alone, as a Baptist, as a Lutheran, that you believe in Jesus and there's nothing that you can do whatsoever. Even obeying whatever, it doesn't matter. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven. Now, as Catholics, everything is by grace. We believe that 100%, but we have to respond to that on a daily basis. Choose God, obey him. This is what, this is what John is saying here. If you want to, If you say you love God, you need to obey his commandments. How does that fit in with faith alone? Now, they will say, well, if you're truly saved, those good works will flow from it. Okay, that's that's the common response. But John says, he who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in, in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly love for God is perfected. By this, we may be sure that we are in him. So we respond to that grace. We We know Jesus told us what to do. Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor. We, we have the works of mercy in Matthew, in the gospel of Matthew. Um, all those things. Are we doing those things? Now, are we doing them to say that we did them? Or are we doing that in response to grace? Say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for setting this opportunity to grow in holiness and to bless this person. And it's not about us. It's all about God when we do these good works, okay? So keep the commandments here. And it's very interesting in um, the Ignatius Study Bible, in the note, uh, Scott Hahn writes, I'm going to read this real quick. The father gives guidance to his children for living and growing in maturity. Obedience to his commandments gives us the moral certitude that we are living as true sons and daughters. In essence, this amounts to imitating Christ, who showed us how to follow the father's commandments without exception or fault. So when we do the commandments that we're told to, we're doing what Jesus did. We're living in that image of God that we're saying we are as Christians. 
So we're, as Christians, through virtue of our baptism, we become adopted sons and daughters. We're born again. We become members of the church. We're members of God's family. By doing these works, by doing following his commandments, we're taking it a step further. We're walking in the image of Christ. We're following that example that Christ has set before us. I think sometimes that gets lost on us. Um, James is a great book. Amen to it. I love it. But mm-hmm. I think so, with some Protestants, if we could prove that case from the same book that they're getting that Trump verse out of, it can go a little further sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and, uh, yeah. And it's very disarming, too, if you could take those go to verses that they use and show that, no, they actually confirm Catholicism. Um, it's like, where else can you go? <laughs> right. And, and what I and what I used to do, Gary, is if someone had a Bible, I would use their Bible and show them these verses. Mm-hmm. And I've done this with with Mormons when they come to my home with the King James Bible. They don't come by anymore. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> but I <laughs> but I, 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 I say, how about this passage? And sometimes like I've never seen that one before. I think it was Marcus Grodi. He has this blog post on the Coming Home Network. The Bible verses I never saw as a Protestant. Mm-hmm. And, and some of these I never saw. I saw 1 John 5, 13 all day long. When I saw this, keep the commandments. Okay, what's Jesus talking about here? You got to do some digging. You got to do some self-reflection. What's Jesus really telling me to do when I'm living as a Christian? So we were talking about Antichrist last segment, Gary. And this is that whole thing is in chapter 2. Starting in verse 18, it says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. But if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they are not of us. It's a lot of words. Okay. But whenever, right now, Gary, there is a situation in protestantism where contemporary christian artists are renouncing christianity i don't know if you've noticed that or not are you familiar with that by any chance no i've just been stuck okay. here in the midwest command center <laughs> really that's all right you're doing god's work but yeah all these christian artists that i grew up on are there's several of them that have renounced the faith and a lot of protestants will point to this verse well they were never part of us hmm. well is that really what it's talking about you see, we have this tendency in the in 2022 to read ourselves into it. This isn't what John's talking about. He's talking about those people who were part of the church and then decided that they're going to follow docetism. So, you, I mean, we can't really connect the two. We can't connect something ancient that John was addressing, docetism, a Christological heresy, and apply it to people who are leaving the church this was t- and some people said this about me when i became catholic oh he wasn't really a christian to begin with yeah and that and that's often told to some that's told to some converts every now and then that's not what john's talking about he was talking about all those people that had left the church to follow corruption um so it was a deviation from the that apostolic faith the faith that was passed on from the apostles mm-hmm so we we could flip it around a little bit. What was the faith that was passed down from the apostles? Well, as obviously as you know, and as the listeners know, Gary, we can go back through history. We can go through the church fathers: Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Augustine, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, John, and see what was passed down, and it's what we have in the Catholic Church. So those who are not of it. This verse can, I mean, if you, you could flip it around and say it applies to them, although it's not a method I would go, but just know if you ever counter with this verse, that's not what John's talking about. He's not talking about you because you became Catholic, okay? He's talking about docetists that left the church and chose not to follow apostolic teaching. When you're coming into the Catholic Church, you're following apostolic teaching. You're following the truth. The Holy Spirit has worked on you and said, hey, this is the truth, and you're following it. I just wanted to mention that, Gary. Sorry. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, uh, First John, like uh, the Gospel of John, big word for him is abide or remain. Yes. You know, they didn't uh, remain with us, and by remaining with you, that's how you get fellowship with the Father and the Son is by remaining right. with the apostles. So yeah, yeah, great points. Right, 
And so we have the, this is where first John is that book where it says, you know, God is love. You know, we hear that a lot. God is love. God is love. And chapter four, verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. So God's whole existence is love. He created us for love. Uh, he wants us to be with him. He sent his son in the flesh to die on the cross for our sins. And so, yes, we reciprocate that love to those around us. And this is it's so fascinating. Getting back to 1 John 5, 13, and sorry if I'm jumping around because there's so much to cover in a short time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yes, love. Paul, notice all this. Believe that Jesus came in the flesh so far. Follow the commandments. Love has got love as God has loved. And we haven't even got to chapter five yet. So we have to do those things, right? And then we get into chapter five where it starts talking about faith, about how everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the one begotten by him. So that's verse that's chapter five, verse one. The very beginning of chapter five where the Trump verse is, is all about a confession of faith to affirm that Jesus is the Messiah and that he's the anointed one of the Father. And so the same thing applies to the sonship. And that, that we see that in the catechism as well. The catechism in 436 and 454 talk about that quite a bit. But there's so much before that Trump verse. We've honestly just scratched the surface. There's more about testing of spirits, um, loving, I've, I've, we talk, we dealt with, well, on loving like God's love, but love one another, even those. And then there's another one. Those who say they have no sin are liars because we all sin. Okay. That's why there's confession going back to my favorite verse of the Bible. First John one, nine, I'm going to say it one more time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This isn't a simple, and I meant to mention this last time when we talked, last segment we talked about it. As a Protestant, I was always taught when you mess up, yeah, your sins are forgiven, but it's always good to go to God and say that you're sorry. Now, as Catholics, we say, yeah, sure, absolutely. Go to God when you recognize that you've messed up and say you're sorry. However, confession is still needed. And that's what John's talking about here. We need, we have the need for repentance, confession, and then we get that forgiveness through the priest. And there's more about sin after that Trump verse, too. <laughs> Absolutely. We're chatting with William Hemsworth. More to come right after this. Stay tuned. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back. We are chatting with William Hemsworth of the uh, Bible Catholic channel on YouTube. And also you can check out his stuff at WilliamHemsworth.com. Talk about eternal security in First John. And uh, yeah, <laughs> Boy, there is so much, so many different things that John has. And so many conditions too. Like you pointed out, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that starts off with an if, you know, a condition. Right. So yeah. it isn't like, hey, you have eternal security. You know that you're going to heaven if, when you have all these if statements, what if you don't? Exactly. If we confess our sins, follow the commandments, love as, love has, as God has loved us, right? Mm-hmm. It all leads into it. If you do those things, okay, then we get the verse, then we get into the Trump verse, chapter 5, verse 13. Okay. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the verse that you're going to hear over and over again for eternal security. All those things come before it. We can't take one verse and isolate it and get a whole doctrine from it. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. There are cults who do the same thing, okay? They take one verse. Arius did this with uh, the book of Proverbs. He got the, he tried to say that Jesus was created based on something he misinterpreted out of the book of Proverbs. 
So it's it's nothing new. But when we're talking about this here, what John is talking about, so he's certain. He's not certain that his readers are going to make it to heaven, but that they're filled with the presence of Christ because they've repented. They're doing what Jesus said to do. They're living as Christians are living. Okay, they believe who Jesus is, that he came in the flesh, he died on the he died on the cross, he died for their sins. So all those conditions, right? All those conditions are there. And so how about this statement with eternal life? How, how do we reconcile that though? Because eternal life, that seems to be pretty cut and dry. However, that's not how John understands eternal life. He understands it as living in the presence of Christ. And we see this a little more in verse 14, where he writes, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his, he's going to hear us. And so what is, what is, what's John talking about here? So it's the type of knowledge, right? It's the type mm -hmm. of knowledge that we have of our salvation. It's not a metaphysical certainty, meaning that there's no doubt whatsoever. Like not meaning I'm going to go, I'm going to drive to the gym later today. And if I get in a car accident, I have no doubt whatsoever that I am going to be in heaven. Now, what I can have is a is confidence that if I'm living in a state of grace, okay, and I've maybe I go into confession on Saturday, I'm not aware of any mortal sin that I've done because later on, after this passage, Gary, after this Trump verse, what does he talk about? He's talking about mortal sins. Which is, I find very fascinating that that was ignored. I never saw this as a Protestant. We talk about Marcus Groda and those verses that I never saw as a Protestant. This is mm -hmm. one of them. Okay, let me see it. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a deadly sin, he will ask and God will give him life for those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin which is deadly. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not deadly. Ask any Protestant out there, they're going to say all sin is deadly, just like this says. And so there's no differentiation between mortal sin, venial sin. A little white lie is the same as murder. But that's where the church gets its teaching on mortal and venial sin. So if I have not committed a mortal sin, I can have confidence that I'll be in heaven when I die. But I can't have that absolute assurance because... Maybe before I die, I do commit some kind of a mortal sin, or maybe I'm aware. This is whole thing. I mean, this isn't something unique to for, unique to John. I mean, what is what does Paul say in First Corinthians four four? I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. Even Paul, who wrote thirteen books of the New Testament, okay, could not say that. Yeah, for sure, I'm going to be in heaven. If anyone could, it'd be him. I would assume if he wrote 13 books of the Bible. So we, there's so much more to it, but not only before Gary, but after that verse that we just have to, we have to understand and we have to take it all into consideration, not just read two lines and say, aha, there it is. I got you do this and you're done. We have the whole other, we have all of sacred scripture and that's what the church does. The church, God bless the church not only because she was established by Christ, but she took into account all of scripture, not just one passage here, one passage here, took into account all of, all of scripture, all of, all of the, all the tradition, all that was taught by Christ and the apostles to come up with their doctrine. And, and, and really it's, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. But the thing with scripture, we have to read it in its entirety. We have to read it in its whole context, not just one verse in isolation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's exactly, I mean, in a way, I mean, that's the power of it in that it's so easy just to throw out a little verse, you know, and right. it's like, hey, it says this and that's the meaning of it. And you don't have to dig in anymore. It just seems apparent. But, you know, a verse taken out of a context can become a pretext, right? Yes. And, right. And uh, so it as Christians, you need to dive into the context. You might have to read the entire letter, right, in order to understand how that one verse fits in with the whole thought of John. Right. And the cool thing about First John, it's not a long read. Yeah. Okay. Fifteen minutes, you're going to get through the whole thing. Okay. 
So if you have a if you have a morning time where you're reading scripture and you're praying, pick up the pick up this book. Now open open your Bible to it. Take 15, 20 minutes, read through it. See exactly what John is saying here. Because you're gonna get so much out of it. I over the past week, I have read this book maybe about seven times. This letter about seven times. Each time I got something new out of it. It's just a treasure trove of information and it's very short. I mean, it's it's super short. 15, 15 20 minutes, you'll go through the whole thing. Good thing to do for Lent, which is coming up, folks. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, just, just saying. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's especially for defenders of the faith out there. You know, it, it's great for spiritual development, but it also gets you biblically literate. And you can you can pinpoint almost immediately when something is being pulled out of context because right. you know the context. Right. No, and I really love the conclusion. And I think it really sums up what we've been talking about. It starts in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding to know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. The very last verse, little children, that's us, keep yourselves from idols. So essentially anyone who is not Jesus, who did not come in the flesh, who is not in all that, is an idol. And obviously... Obviously, we can take this a few extra ways. We know who John is talking about here, a false Jesus. But how many false Jesuses are we erecting in our lives on a daily basis? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have our phones. How many of us are our phones an idol? Do we spend more time on it? I see people in mass on their phone. Breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, social media. As much as I love social media, we can spend way too much time on it, make it become an idol. Anything in our lives has the potential to become an idol. It's a wake-up call for us, too. Let's make sure our eyes are set on Christ, that our lives are focused on Christ, and we'll be all right. That's what we've got to do. Yep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, very encouraging words. And, uh, yeah, it's such a beautiful epistle. I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, if you're thinking, what am I going to do this Lent? To help me grow spiritually, definitely read scripture. You know, come up with some sort of schedule for scripture reading. And while you're at it, why don't you throw in some early church fathers as well? Yes. yes. Yeah, especially like uh, apostolic fathers, Ignatius of Antioch for a number of years, William. Every Lent, I would read the seven letters from Ignatius. And man, uh, knowing this guy practice. is going to his martyrdom. Uh, is heart-wrenching and spiritually nourishing, and also it helps you great for defending faith because you know Ignatius of Antioch. Yeah, that's definitely one of the ones everyone should read. And that's a great practice. I think I'm going to try to do that this year is read the seven letters. That's a great one. I've um, Polycarp is one of my favorites. I've read, I read his stuff every Lent too, his martyrdom mm -hmm. and his letter to the Philippians. Um, because cause that was one of those beginning seeds that were planted was reading him, especially when it came to the Deuterocanon and relics and everything else. So yeah, definitely. Church father, scripture, it's a good time to grow. I mean, there's so many of these books in the New Testament, Gary, that are really short. Like this one here, 15 minutes. Um, I read something yesterday that Paul's letter to Philemon is three minutes long. It's only 250 words. I mean, yeah. we, we could all spare that. Um, yeah. Just get off Netflix for about 30 minutes, and you're going to read some great scripture. You're going to grow in your faith. And really, you're going to be able to defend your faith a lot more by knowing scripture. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, great. So there's your action uh, plan, folks, for Lent uh, coming right before Ash Wednesday. Uh, right. William, we, we have a couple of minutes left in the program, and I want to talk to you about, uh, you know, the Bible Catholic channel on YouTube and all the stuff you've been doing. Things have been going well. I've been, I post about one episode a week. I recently had Father Gerald Murray. He's on EWTN regularly. He's part of the Papal Posse. He's coming up with a new book from... Um, St. Paul Center, Emmaus Road, Scott Hahn's uh, apostolate about crisis in the church and overcoming it and everything. So we had him. I uh, recently had an interview that I posted on Monday, Dr. Bruce Tallman. He's a spiritual director in Canada, but he gave his conversion story as well. Former progressive Mennonite. I didn't know that hmm. was such a thing. So he blew my mind with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I had him and... Um, of course, I'll be talking with uh, David L. Gray pretty soon. We're going to talk about the liturgy. So that's coming up in a couple weeks. And I'm working on 
on getting our friend Mike Aquilina back on because he's always releasing something new. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable yeah, how much know. he does. I know. Yeah, it is amazing. It's like every two months there's a new book. I'm like, how? <laughs> he must buy Locate or something because I, I don't know how he can do all the things he does. <laughs> But yeah, I'm just really trying to and trying to get platform to those people are getting off. I was recently on Eddie Trask's channel. Thanks for referring me to him, by the yeah. way. He told me yeah, about Eddie. that. So we had a lot of fun on his channel a couple weeks ago. I actually did the interview from my classroom right after school. I locked the door, put a sign on there saying I'm in a Zoom meeting, <laughs> and we stayed in there for about an hour talking about the faith. It was a great time. That's kind of what's going on on my channel. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so it's uh, just go on YouTube. Uh, type in Bible Catholic or William Hemsworth and check it out, folks. Lots of great stuff. William, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. It's always a pleasure. Have a great week. All right. Yes. Check it out, folks. WilliamHemsworth.com. And man, the hour is gone and the week is gone, believe it or not. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you with the Terry and Jesse Show. And it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center, turn off the dojo lights. Thank you so much for listening. God willing, we'll be back again next week. Do this thing with all hands on the podcast. Bye-bye, everybody.